John Hinchke at University of Missouri St. Louis um, getting ready for an interactive dynamic lecture in an iandragogical fashion with uh, doctoral students and faculty at North Dakota State University in Fargo on uh, Friday, September, I mean Friday, October 17th, uh, 2008. Our session is meant to be from 1.15 in the afternoon to 2.15, and we'll see how closely we're able to, to uh, uh, hew to that time frame. That's my commitment, and we'll see what's, what takes place in all this. <clears throat> Tom Hall is going to be introducing me. I met him at an adult education conference. He's professor at North Dakota State University. Thinking about uh, having the assignments to the, to the various um, tables, if you can tell me at the time when we start how many tables have people at them. Okay. They said there were 14 tables there, right? Right. 14? Is that what we have? I think there are, but I don't know if they're all there. Four, five, six, seven. Yeah, there, there are about 14 tables. I know some folks uh, had to leave right after lunch here, John, but I will. Okay. Can, can you see the crowd out there? Can you see yes. the folks up there? Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll count them up. Okay. We'll be very informal here. Yeah, good. good. I, um, basically, I've got four, uh, four different kinds of teams for listening. So wow. we'll assign oh, okay. uh, that, that kind of thing to, to multiple tables, but I just want to know how many there were. Very good. And so do you want to break the group up into four different groups? Well, no, no, no. Leave them at their tables. I want the tables to work on the various things, and I'll, I'll you know, have the, have the listening team set up that way. Excellent. Okay. You okay. just tell us what to do. We'll get her done. I'll do. All right. <laughs> Thanks, this Tom. afternoon, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you uh, a world-renowned adult educator, Dr. John Henschke. Before I turn the floor over to John, however, I want to tell you a bit about his life and his achievements. Dr. Henschke has had two major life callings. The first was to serve God and man in the ministry. He received his bachelor's degree in English, biblical studies, and music, and later collected two master's degrees from Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in Chicago. One was a master's in divinity, the other a master's in theology. Now how anybody gets a master's in theology is really beyond me. I'm married to a Methodist pastor and we have a rather eclectic book collection at our house. And if you think that it's difficult late at night to get through a book on organizational theory, Pick up the Confessions of Thomas Aquinas some evening and try to get through that. <laughs> For 10 years, John served a number of churches as a pastor, educator, and counselor until he received his second calling. That calling to education has lasted over 40 years. When John decided to pursue his doctorate in adult education in the late 1960s, his mentor gave him a list of four universities to consider, and as a dutiful young academic, he contacted all of them. And of the four, he says he's still waiting to hear from one. <laughs> John selected Boston University and came under the mentorship of Dr. Malcolm S. Knowles, who schooled this eager young student with a new concept at the time called andragogy. The idea that adults learn differently than children and instructional methods used with adults should reflect those differences. John is a true believer in the psychological principles of andragogy, and his life work is a tribute to his mentor, Malcolm Knowles. But John can tell you more about that in his remarks. For the last 38 years, John has served as professor and of adult education at the University of Missouri in St. Louis and in that time has mentored thousands of adult educators who are now spreading the gospel according to Henschke in hundreds of universities, <laughs> governments, agencies, 
and community organizations and institutions across this great land and indeed the world. I will close with listing just a few of John's more recent achievements. I could go on, believe me, and looking at his dossier for at least an hour. But some of the more recent ones, John is past president of the American Association of Adult and Continuing Education. He's a recipient of the 2005 Outstanding Service Medallion for that same in, uh, association. He's a recipient of the Missouri State Distinguished Service Award in 2004 and he was inducted into the International Adult and Continuing Education Hall of Fame in 1998. So he's a lifelong learner and adult educator who has taught students from 84 different countries. So please join me in welcoming today's keynote speaker, Dr. John Hinchke. Turn her over to you. <laughs> thank you very much, Tom, and uh, I'm delighted and honored to be with you today at this session for the doctoral students and their faculty at North Dakota State University. As you know, um, um, this session is to be sort of a combination of uh, Malcolm Knowles and Andrew Goji and then the live doctoral participants at North Dakota State University. So we want to put some of that together. I want to uh, refer you to the packet that uh, you have received, the packet of materials uh, from me. And if you'll notice, uh, I have a table of contents under the, uh, under the title page, and the page numbers are listed there. Those page numbers refer to the number that I have handwritten in a circle on the top right-hand corner of each page. So if I refer to a particular page uh, in our packet, then you turn to that rather than our trying to have to hunt around and uh, find those. That's uh, for our convenience in finding our way through this packet of materials. Also, in, in uh, the, the third page underneath the, the um, a table of contents, you'll find sort of a sequence of what we're going to be trying to accomplish during this hour that we are uh, together. And so if you'll uh, have those um, materials handy for you uh, as we uh, move forward uh, in our session together. I'm also going to um, ask that um, I want to do an assignment, uh, if you will. And I'd like to uh, have you turn to, uh, I think it's page 31. Uh, page 31 of the packet, if you will. I want to do an interactive lecture today, and so I want to assign you as listening teams. Page 31, we talk about large group meetings, enhancing interaction with listening teams. I'm going to ask that um, uh, there be teams at each one of the tables. The, we're going to uh, divide up into four different teams clarification, rebuttal, elaboration, and practical application. And as I give this short lecture, I'm going to ask that you uh, will be listening for uh, things that you would like to have addressed or raise questions about uh, from your listening team's standpoint when we get to that juncture in our lecture and in our session. So I'd like to have the, the folks that um, are, I think we've got, what, 14 tables? And I'd like to have three or four, uh, four tables uh, be assigned as clarification team people. Four tables. And I'd like to have that over on my left-hand side, which would be your right-hand side, as I, um, as I look at the audience there, OK? If four of those tables will uh, take the assignment of being clarification teams. Thanks for your help, Tom, in this, this sure. uh, process. The second group of teams, I'd like to have four tables be assigned what's called the rebuttal team, or listening to me for things you would like to take issue with or disagree with. All right, then since there are 14 teams, we'll, we'll drop that down to three tables be assigned the listening team uh, uh, assignment of elaboration. What are the, the things that you would like to, for me to say more about what I've said? 
And then uh, the fourth group, which would be three, the last three tables, would be ones of practical application. What issues of practical application uh, would you like to have addressed regarding the things that I have said uh, in the lecture? Now, I hope that particular part of it is clear. And as you have your listening assignment, I will then uh, begin to launch into um, uh, the lecture itself that I will give to you, which will be a very short duration. Are there any questions at this particular time that, um, that, that need to be raised? If not, I'll go ahead. I would like for you to turn to page number seven in your packet, page number seven, and if you'll turn it on its side, you will see the first time, or replica of the first time that the word andragogy was ever used in, in published form, and it was uh, an article by Alexander Kapp in Germany in the year 1833. Uh, the, the, uh, the type is a bit uh, blurred, but di difficult to uh, distinguish. But if you look at the bottom there, um, our friend from Germany has given us an English uh, translation of, of what this um, article title is and the man's name and the year. And if you want to see the replica, you can go to uh, the uh, website on that, um, on that uh, document. Now, if you will turn then to um, uh, page eight in your, in your document, um, I want to give to you or show you sort of a, um, a chart form of Malcolm's involvement, Malcolm Knowles' involvement uh, in andragogy as he has depicted it uh, in this, the assumptions of andragogy as well as the process elements that have to do with that. I want to say that uh, andragogy, uh, the first assumption that we make is that adults uh, need to know why they need to learn something, and that reason needs to be one that makes sense to them, not just because I, as a teacher, or someone else has said you need to know something. It is that you want to have a reason for why you want to learn something as an adult. The second assumption that we make about, about adult learners is that they have a, a concept of increasingly self-directedness. They want to know, um, and, and they, they have the potential and they have the desire for increasing self-directedness as far as their learning is concerned. A third assumption that we make about adult learners is that uh, in their role as a learner, uh, they want it to be built upon, uh, they want it to be built upon their um, developmental tasks of, of social, uh, for social learning. Um, that's the one that, that has to do with readiness for learning. The one on, on the role of the learner really has to do with the fact that um, we want to be active in our learning because uh, as we have lived as adults, we gain an experience base of learning that can become a resource for our own as well as other people's learning. And so consequently, we want to see what we can do to foster that and bring that and make that available to other people's learning. The readiness to learn is, to, is based on the developmental tasks of social roles, such as if I'm, I'm going to a new job, I need to know what that role is, and I'm ready to learn things that, uh, that have to do with that. If I'm going to be a new father, I'm much more ready to learn about that than I would be if, uh, if I were a teenager or if I were at some age and not uh, ready to have a, a newborn child. The orientation to learning is much more in, in adults is toward um, immediate application as contrasted with postponed application. And the motivation for learning in adults is much more internal than external, intrinsic than extrinsic. The process elements that have to do with andragogy, according to what Malcolm Knowles has said, is that preparation is the first step. 
The, uh, the setting of the climate for learning that is conducive for adult learning is second. Third, it has to do with establishing a structure for mutual participative planning. And the fourth is diagnosis of learning. Uh, what is the, uh, the um, vision that I have of what it means to be a good whatever, and in this case, it may be a good adult learner. And then the setting of a, the objectives that go on, um, uh, that grow out of the diagnosis for, for learning, and, and we are engaged at, at each one of the steps of the way, then designing a, learn, a set of learning plans or the structure of the learning plans um, uh, for carrying out uh, the learning that I have determined that I want to, and then the learning activities themselves, and then the evaluation or the rediagnosis of learning. We've come this far, we want to go, um, uh, we want to see where it is that we need to go as far as our uh, next step is concerned. Uh, and that's b basically becomes a cycle in which we go through uh, as adult as adult learners. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I want to say also in terms of my own take and involvement in andragogy, um, if you'll uh, look on uh, page, um, uh, page 45, page 45 of your, in, of your packet, you will see an instrument that I have developed uh, in, which I call the Instructional Perspectives Inventory. And the element that comes out the most in that, I've given to you uh, the instrument and the scoring, and so you might want to use that for yourself if you want to uh, pursue this any farther after, we, uh, uh, after we're done with our session today. But um, the major element has to do with the teacher trust of learners and co communicating that to uh, the learners. And um, then um, our... our Next element, as far as what I want to say about this, is the fact that we are here together. Uh, I'm in St. Louis, you're in Fargo, but we're uh, gathered for the purpose of exploring the meaning of andragogy, and that's what I say is the live doctoral participants. This is all I want to say at this particular point at, um, uh, about uh, Malcolm Knowles, Andrew Goji, and your involvement, and I'd like to have you go in your groups, your table groups, and generate one or two questions or comments that you might like to generate that you can come back to me in a little bit, and I, we will try to address each one of those issues as, uh, as we come to them uh, after you get them generated. So you go, if you go in your, your uh, table groups and generate your comment or your uh, question that has to do with the category of listening team that you're involved with, okay? So John, John do you, would you like him to take like five minutes to do that? Or uh, yeah, longer? I'd say five to seven minutes at most, okay? Okay. And, and maybe okay. you can I indicate to me kind of when the decibel level uh, lowers at the tables yeah, and they seem like they're ready, okay? Okay, very good, thanks John. Thank you. <laughs> okay, five to seven minutes or until the decibel is lower.
Tom. Tom, can you? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Do you want to uh, sort of start getting them to wrap their their thing up and make an assignment of a spokesperson who will come to the microphone? Very good. Okay. What we'll do to continue on with this adult learning exercise is for each of your tables have a, uh, I guess for not each of your tables, but for each of the, the roles that you're playing, either in clarification, what would you like, John, to clarify? How would you, is there something that you'd like to have a rebuttal on? What would you like to have him elaborate on and in practical application? We'd like to have one spokesperson bring a question up that we can then direct to John. So please decide on a question and a spokesperson, and then in about uh, a minute, we'll start and we'll have one person come up from each of the groups and uh, direct a question. Is that how we want to handle this, John? Hello. We're going to just take one group, one person from from uh, the clarification table, any one of the clarification tables, and we'll right. address that question first. And we'll, we'll we'll go to each one of the four, and then we'll if we have time, we'll go back to the to the other tables. Oh, okay, very good. Okay. So at your table, then excuse me, then I, I did misspeak. So then at your table, select one into one question and one individual who will come up, and we'll start with clarification. We have someone ready for a, clarif a clarification question who wants to come up to the microphone now. One clarifier. <laughs> okay, so we're just about ready, John. Okay. clarification table, one rebuttal, one elaboration, and one practical application, and then we'll swing back around again. Okay. okay, so you want me to just ask one question? That's correct. Okay, the first question that our groups came up with were, when are learners considered adult? In other words, when do you become an adult learner? Is it defined by age or sophistication as learners? There are a number of um, uh, definitions for adults and adults as learners, but the one excuse I... Excuse me, excuse me, John. Could yes? you please shift the camera to yourself? We just have the, uh, uh, the large group meeting piece. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Is it okay now? Sorry. Yep. All right. Um, there are a number of different definitions for, um, uh, for adult learners, and you can... Uh, you know, for whatever purposes in education, you can decide which one of the ones that you want to take. But uh, generally, we, I will um, focus on uh, an, a, a person who is ready to take responsibility for their own learning, who um, has taken responsibility in their life for other aspects of it. Uh, and so that is not uh, necessarily uh, tied to the chronological age, although sometimes it is. But the issue has to do with the readiness for taking responsibility. That does not mean always that um, when we ask somebody to take responsibility, they're particularly ready, but nevertheless, uh, we make that assumption that there is that desire, and we seek to foster that and undergird that and encourage it. And so, as a consequence, uh, we seek, I, I seek to act, uh, to act in that regard toward the person. All right? How about a question on rebuttal, or, uh, an issue that you might like to take with what I have said? Are 
our group was talking about um, if adults learn best when they're involved in determining what, how, and when they learn, then how would you defend the concept of Montessori schools for children or the process of formative assessment um, that is currently being used in K-12 schools? I, um, I think that um, if, if I understand the uh, constructivism, the Montessori school, the schools, the, um, uh, that kind of evaluation, the formative evaluation, that uh, there are some givens as far as the school is concerned, at least from, from my standpoint. Uh, we cannot say, I, I don't think that we can say, um, this is uh, a place where people can gather to do uh, basket weaving or uh, only come uh, to play. There, it, it is a place where um, I think the foundational element has to do with um, uh, learning, the learning on the part of the individual and uh, on a part, the part of the person. And I think the nature of the human being, whether it's an adult or a child, but much more in an adult, the nature uh, of ourselves as human beings is that we are uh, learners at heart. And that's the part that uh, we need to think about interacting with. The teacher always, as I see it, never gives up their perspective in terms of what it means uh, for why they are there. If a, in a Montessori school, a teacher is there only to play, I'm, I would question whether or not uh, they're there as uh, fosters of learning. Uh, the same thing with, um, with the uh, formative evaluation. If there is, uh, if we're talking about a course in, in math or in English, or in um, whatever history, there is some reason why uh, that class has been formed, unless uh, you're talking about just coming for a free-for-all and, and anybody do, does whatever that they want. I hope that that uh, addresses in, in some fashion. I think uh, as an educator, I always have a perspective that uh, a, a part of the reason why I'm there is to help to foster the learning in uh, the people that are there. Okay? Uh, what about elaboration? Do we have a group that is uh, ready to raise an elaboration question? Yes, we do. Okay. But I was sitting way in the back. All right. And I'm an old man. It takes me a long time to get up here. <laughs> okay. On page, uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the ultimate adult learner. On page uh, eight, we have the assumptions and uh, process elements of the uh, various models. Yes. The uh, last one under process elements, the evaluation uh, under andragogy, by learner collected evidence validated by peers, facilitators, experts, criterion reference. Could you? Uh, actually explain that more, how that would be done. Collecting evidence uh, validated by peers. The, one of the questions that um, I, I would raise with that, uh, or one of the responses that I would raise with that, is if I want to be, um, if I want to th uh, do some thinking about uh, something that has to do with health-related matters, and I want to learn that, uh, I'm not going to go to uh, an auto mechanic to, to ask them to validate my learning. If I structure my learning um, in accordance with trying to find out a health-related matter, someone who will uh, do the validation or uh, uh, will look at my evidence in learning something, uh, I would want to choose someone who is in the health field, who knows and, and is, um, uh, is competent in that particular field. It may be one of my peers. It may be a friend of mine. It, um, if, I, um, if I want to know something about a, uh, do, uh, developing or, or fixing uh, my car, I would want to go to an auto mechanic. And uh, I would want to go to someone 
who not only knows auto mechanics, but also uh, has maybe some experience in teaching it. If, it, if it's nothing more than one-on-one, -on -one, if this person in the, in the uh, garage has been able to take uh, different individuals who came to work there and explain to them some of the things that has to have to do about that, they would be facilitators of the learning as far as auto mechanics are concerned. Experts, of course, are, are people who are in education, but they are not limited to those who are, are in education because someone who has worked on the line and, and has done a particular uh, a piece of work over the period of years may well be the best expert who knows what is involved in, in that kind of thing. And criterion reference, of course, would be uh, something that would be a preset standard. Of course, uh, when you're talking about automobile mechanics, there are certain things that have to be done with certain pieces of that, that uh, uh, in order for the car to work. Uh, you couldn't just have any standard uh, and say, well, uh, I want to build things the way they are, and, um, and I don't want to uh, look at the uh, necessities of, that have to do with, with uh, engine combustion, uh, if you will. So that if they don't have that criterion uh, in there, then uh, the fact is that the automobile will, will not work and the learning will not be uh, very uh, valued in that particular regard. So you look for your resources. Uh, at various places within the community as well as within the school uh, and um, in, in family relationships or friend, friend relationships or wherever you could find those. You might uh, want to look at uh, page, um, page uh, is it 16, I think, 15, I should say, page 15. Uh, there is where Malcolm Knowles uh, on that chart, uh, t uh, table one, uh, you'll see that Malcolm Knowles talks about um, uh, accessing various resources within the community for addressing various learning needs of, of people. And as a consequence, uh, you can uh, uh, look at that and, and th uh, seeing about mixing and matching the kinds of, um, uh, the kinds of uh, learning needs that there are with the kind of resources there are uh, out in the community. Um, how about the practical application issue? Our question was, um, as educators, how can we assist our students in making the transition from having experiences and expectations of pedagogy to andro andragogy as adult learners? Okay. Um, part of it has to do with, uh, I, I have found that uh, I have to determine uh, whether or not I consider myself as self-directed, as uh, being an andragogue. It's a learning process. It, it is not as if I can stand out say, uh, outside and say, I want you to follow the andragogy principles, but I'm going to do it in a pedagogical way. That it seems to me to be rather incongruent and uh, conflicting as far as um, the process is concerned. So the first thing uh, that I have to come to terms with myself regarding whether or not I am prepared to uh, be an, an, uh, an andragogue, if you will, uh, one who uh, uh, accepts andragogy, and whether or not I am willing to take the first steps and the second steps and the third steps and experiment and, and seek to hone my own ability regarding andragogy if I expect them to um, move in the direction uh, of uh, accepting and, and acting like andragogues um, or people who are willing to take responsibility uh, for their own learning. Uh, it comes, uh, a transition from uh, being uh, pedagogically oriented to andragogically oriented comes, is, as I would say, in sort of in fits and starts. It does not come automatically. It's not uh, like one day we just wake up and, and all of a sudden we're, uh, we're oriented to andragogy when we've been oriented to, to pedagogy. It's a matter of taking uh, short steps, small steps from where we are and making certain that where I am uh, there I'm ready to, uh, to move forward. One of the, one of the things that uh, 
you may want to use to to identify yourself in in terms of your own readiness to do that would be to, to look at the instructional perspectives inventory and um, uh, beginning on page 45 go through that instrument and see where you are on on the one major element there are are all of all the seven factors are uh, there and are, are important but the one major element that has been substantiated uh, through research in in that instrument has to do with teacher trust of learners there are 11 elements in that that uh, that uh, have been included and you may want to assess yourself uh, on the instrument, uh, the best way you can do it is find out where you are without, you know, going to the answer sheet for, uh, first. Say where you are, then score your um, uh, your own instrument and see where you are. And uh, if you're not uh, at a level of, of readiness for the teacher trust of learners, uh, which is the, uh, the the factor, which is uh, the major factor that underlies that instrument, uh, you may want to say, well, what what am I willing to uh, change, and what am I willing to adjust as far as my own perception uh, is concerned? And you may want to also uh, go to uh, uh, page 40, the modeling, the preparation of adult uh, educators. Um, that article in there includes those 11 elements that have to do with teacher trust of learners. Okay, now you may have uh, uh, regrouped yourselves and say, this guy didn't answer um, uh, sufficiently to what I would like to have known, and you may want to come back at me uh, uh, as we go around the second round, but, but if there are, there are other questions that are ready uh, from other groups, that have not been up to the uh, to the microphone. Uh, can we call for now a second clarification question from another table? Okay, this question may seem just a like a repeat, but I think we're looking for a sort of a specific. Clarification: How would you define readiness to learn, according to you know? In other words, distinguish between andragogy and pedagogy. The, the readiness to learn uh, really has to do in in andragogy with the developmental tasks of social roles. Um, if I am faced with uh, being on a ball team, and I want to get ready for that. My readiness to learn what I have to do in order to uh, qualify for being on that ball team is much more heightened than it is for someone to say to a fifth grader saying, you may want to uh, be that, uh, you may want to play baseball someday, and so you need to get ready for that. If there is someone who wants to um, be uh, one of the major players or try out for a part in a play at the, at the school, uh, they may want to look at their sense of readiness to play that part. And a lot of times the way that is tried out is that they, they are given a script and then they read it and they see what kind of expressiveness they have regarding this. Regarding this. Uh, readiness to learn as far as an arithmetic problem might be uh, in the whole business of uh, a person, a young person is wanting uh, to take the money that they have saved, albeit maybe a small amount, but they want to buy something. And um, if they want to uh, see what is the best bargain that they can get and the best uh, uh, type of uh, product that they can get, then they may want to or uh, may need to uh, look at the whole business about uh, mathematics of calculating uh, what a particular product uh, represents and how much uh, am I willing to give for that? Am I willing to, to uh, say if I have $100, am I willing to give $10 for it? Am I willing to give $40 for it? 
uh, and, and what kind of a product can I get for those particular uh, items, uh, and, uh, and thus go through that kind of a calculation uh, for uh, the whole business about being ready to learn rather than simply it's being an abstract concept. How about uh, uh, another question on rebuttal? Or taking issue of what I have said? Hi, right, we came up with a question. All right. Um, all right. Why is it then that um, with, with education practices that currently the students are expected and the educators are expected to merge the learning of the task problem centered or the andrological with the subject-centered or pedagogical uh, students. You see it more and more that the uh, high schools are and the, the elementary levels are trying to teach andrological type philosophies to these young learners that maybe or maybe aren't ready. Uh, let me uh, let me zero into um, what I think is. One of the, the one of the major elements that have to do has to do with um, educational uh, positions or educational institutional positions. Um, how did uh, that school system get into uh, the thinking that they needed to use uh, andragogical processes? What kind of processes did they go through in order to move themselves in that direction? What kind of readiness and what kind of preparation was gone through for the administrators, the school system, the teachers to make that decision about um, we want to go in this particular direction? And what kind of assessment did they do for themselves in terms of their own readiness? There are a number of instruments. Uh, the one that I uh, provided in the packet is not the only one that has to do that with that. But the, the question has to do with, I have found um, I am not ready to foster someone else in a particular area for um, learning the subject that is at hand. I am not ready to do that unless I have gone, uh, I mean, andragogically. I'm not ready to do that unless I have prepared myself and, and said, what kinds of questions do I want to ask? What kinds of preparation do I need to have in order to ready myself for that? What is it I want to find out as far as history is concerned, if you will, and for what purpose? How does that go along with with uh, the whole notion. Uh, and part of what I'm saying is I think uh, educational systems uh, have a, a tendency like, sometimes like corporate systems, to pick up on the jargon of the six month period. Um, we've seen that especially in, in corporations. What, what is the jargon for this six month period? And many of the people that are involved with corporations say, well, this, fa this fad will pass in the next six months. And I think that is in part uh, one of the things that, that is so important. Uh, one of the research pieces that uh, I did with one of my doctoral students here had to do with looking at um, principals as uh, learning leaders in the school system. And they took teachers as learners, principals being uh, the, the ones who need to foster the learning in, in teachers. And we, we went through the instrument of the Instructional Perspectives Inventory, and we looked at the teacher's uh, rating of the, uh, their perception about how much they felt their principals trusted them as far as their learning was concerned. And then we asked the principals to rate themselves as far as how much they believed that they trusted their teachers to be the learners that they needed to be as far as new things. And uh, it was interesting to see that there was quite a gap between how the principals saw themselves as learners and how the teachers 
uh, I mean, uh, how the principals saw themselves as trusting the teachers uh, as far as uh, taking responsibility for their learning. Uh, there was a gap between how they rated themselves and how the teachers rated their perception about the whole business, uh, about trusting them as learners. And when you have that kind of, uh, a, kind of a gap, there is, one of the important things uh, is to begin to think about closing that gap between uh, the perception of the teachers and the perception of uh, the pe perception of the teachers about the administrator administrators as uh, learning leaders and the uh, the perception of the administrator administrators as being the learning leaders and what they're communicating to the teachers. Well, if you take that down a step, you you might get the same kind of thing that has to do with the gap between. Um, what the teachers are perceiving themselves as being in regard to andragogy and what the, the students are. I had another, um, another research study that was done that uh, the school systems are not set up for self-directed learning or fostering andragogy. And uh, dropouts uh, were the, the ones that scored a little bit higher on the uh, self-directed learning readiness scale as contrasted with those who were uh, very acquiescent as far as the, um, the school systems uh, are concerned. Um, I, I hope that that addresses, addresses the issue. We got, it, it's a matter of being prepared to uh, be responsive uh, and see ourselves as, uh, learn, uh, as lifelong learners, learners. How about uh, the elaborators? Any more elaboration questions? I think we've been uh, kind of skirting around this issue for the last few minutes and it's been very interesting. Could you uh, help me to understand the relationship? Uh, you talk about readiness to learn. Um, uh, to me, it's, it's often a question for, for teachers to be ready to empower the student to learn. To me, it's a question of empowerment. And, uh, you know, these, uh, we talk about, you know, andragogy, adult learning. Well, these kids are younger and younger and younger and ready to do it. We're just not willing to em empower them to do that. So could you speak to that, please? Thank you. Well, the issue, in, the issue of em empowerment, um, I, I think I understand your, uh, your question. Um, Um, I think there is a, a, a perception on the part of, of students that they are much more ready to uh, be self-directed and take responsibility for their learning at an earlier stage than uh, what our system is ready to allow them to be uh, empowered. Uh, if I feel like there is pressure as, as a teacher that my system is in, insisting that uh, there is a definite connection between um, uh, teaching and learning, uh, there, there is a conflict in terms of my own perception about that. I may find myself in a push-pull kind of situation because a lot of the research that's been done in, uh, in, in public school areas, if you will, or in the K through 12 area, has to do with uh, how students respond to the act of teaching. And adult, uh, adult education is more oriented toward the question about learning. The response to the, the act of teaching is not particularly um, has to do, it doesn't particularly have to do with uh, learning itself. Uh, if you look at the research as far as learning is concerned, uh, the learning is always in the control of the learner. Now the implications of that are, are monumental as far as I'm concerned, because I think we have a, a system uh, largely promulgated in this country unless I'm out of the loop too much, uh, but promulgated in this country that buys into the idea if the students do not learn, the teachers have not taught. And so there is a, uh, uh, 
uh, disconnect as far as the research is concerned. Uh, the teachers can uh, make the climate uh, in every way possible to enrich it so that uh, uh, students can be uh, involved and can be empowered. But unless the system allows for that, and if you will, the politicians, um, if, they allow, if they don't allow for that, then we're sort of under the gun, under a push-pull kind of thing. Because I think in the anthropological frame of reference, if you look back on page eight, uh, the, um, the two elements that are so very important regarding that has to do with the enriching of the climate for learning and the diagnosis of the needs. How much are we willing and ready to uh, engage people in the diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of their own needs? In, in pedagogy, I think uh, most, of, at least most of my experience has been that the learning really doesn't take place or is not perceived of as taking place until we get to, to the seventh step, the learning activities. Whereas in an andragogical uh, frame of reference, the learning starts with the very first element, the preparation, the learning setting of the learning climate the planning, the diagnosis, the setting of objectives, the designing of how we're going to go about this, and the learning activities. The learning's been going on all throughout in the evaluation. For me, the, um, the empowering, uh, in a large measure, has to do with the climate factor there, that the climate is relaxed, it is trusting, it is mutually respectful, it is informal, warm, collaborative, supportive. That doesn't mean we uh, say, well, we're here and anybody can do anything they want. Because I think we have to step back and simply say, we are educators. I am a learner and I am interested in continuing learning and helping to foster uh, much of that. Are we, are we ready to go then with a, a practical application question, a second one? I was wondering how much does it vary from culture to culture, and I was thinking about some of the students who I have right now in my courses that I start to question if it's a cultural difference or if it's a personality difference or can I treat some of my students from the pedagogy type of a standpoint because that's what they need and maybe from their culture they're just more used to that and so I'm actually being more culturally competent by helping them because that's where they come from. I think that's a, a, a well-taken point. And I think when we look at the contrast between andragogy and pedagogy, one of the things that Malcolm Knowles did along the way was to um, say that uh, there are times in which it is appropriate to use pedagogy, and there are times in which there, it is appropriate to use andragogy. Uh, using pedagogy with adults or with children, if you will, uh, and using andragogy with children and adults, if you will. Now, um, one of the, the andragogues um, uh, throughout the world, uh, Dusan Savicevic from Yugoslavia, kind of got after Malcolm for uh, sort of selling out uh, andragogy in that particular regard. And you'll see that in, in the article that has to do uh, with um, um, with the short bio on page one, the short bio of Malcolm and Andragogy and his place in, in Andragogy. But there are appropriate times when a person does not know anything about a subject, period, knows nothing about it. I think it is very appropriate to use pedagogy, not in a pedantic way, but in, in a way to orient uh, people and give them the initial subject matter uh, regarding that, but with an eye toward uh, after they have been introduced and have a little bit of progress in the knowledge of the subject matter to then think about how do I want to shift over into um, working andragogically with them and encouraging them to, to come forward um, and, and take responsibility uh, for their uh, own learning. Because uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that um, 
uh, in the research that was done at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education with Alan Tuff is uh, when he researched uh, about adults' learning projects, he found that 98% um, uh, of what we learn is not for credit. Now, he's talking about adults. Uh, that means 98% um, uh, is for credit. So, I mean, 2% is, is for credit, excuse me. Uh, and so that means that while children may not be that high as far as uh, uh, they, they might be that 40 or 50 percent of what they learn or 30 percent of what they learn um, is for credit in the school to pass the grades that they, they seek to pass. But there are things that they are learning out uh, on the playground and in their daily activities with their families and with their friends that they are learning uh, many things that have to do with learning outside of the classroom. And that, has not, uh, that does not have a teacher that is, is seeking to foster that kind of thing. So uh, we uh, need to think about uh, how can we uh, simply take them and encourage them to transfer some of that into the classroom and take more responsibility. What do they want to take responsibility for today that they didn't take responsibility for tomorrow? I mean, yesterday. And, and so on. Any other, uh, uh, now, we want to, I think we want to come back and uh, I think our time is probably uh, getting close to, to being at the end. Tom, do you want to say something right now? Sure, maybe we'll take one more question and uh, if anybody has a, a question from any of the groups, clarification, rebuttal, elaboration, practical application, we'll take one more and then uh, we'll, we'll let John uh, then give us uh, his closing remarks. So, okay. one last. One last question. Going once? Going twice? <laughs> I think you can conclude. <laughs> okay. Thank All right. You. I'd like for you to turn to the session, uh, the session schedule on, um, uh, on the second page after the, the cover page. And at the end, I, I want to wrap up uh, with having you finish the phrase and verbally sharing. As a result of this session, I will. There is, we don't expect that a whole lot of, of, of change or new things or new thoughts may have come to you, but I would like to have a couple, a few people uh, that are willing to take the risk to write down as a result of this session today, I will, and, and it needs to be something about um, what we have seeking, been seeking to learn, uh, if you will uh, write that down and then come to the podium uh, when you're ready uh, to just share with that some small thing that you may have decided to learn. Have we got a couple of risk takers? Yeah, I see one hand going up back there. If you'll come up to the uh, podium and, and share that with us, that'll be great. Hi, I'm Lynn Willoughby. Uh, I plan to do my doctoral research on um, assessment and evaluation methods as they can be used in online classroom environments. And as part of my literature review, I've been looking at co um, constructivism, behaviorism as educational schools of thought, I think I will be incorporating some additional study into the area of andragogy to see how that connects in. Thank you. That's, that's great to hear. Um, there we also, I, I, I just want to mention that there are other resources uh, regarding andragogy that's on my website that you see there and, and you are free to go there and uh, access those materials. I've done a, a good bit of research uh, regarding uh, andragogy and uh, some of those articles uh, as I've gone through iterations for about eight years now are, are much more extensive than what uh, that what I provided in the um, in the packet that you have today is there somebody else that'll uh, take a risk and and share um, their what they'll do My name is Valerie and I'm a newly hired professor in um, the university here in Moorhead. And so as a result of this session and 
and what I'm learning here. I will definitely read your packet and find out more about how this applies to me as one who certainly instructs adults. Thank you. It's meant to be a resource for you to take with you. Great. Any, anybody else? My name is Colleen Bremer, and I received my doctorate uh, last December. And I was fascinated by your instrument and also um, by your reference to some research in um, uh, principles as teachers of teachers. And so I, I did some work in uh, self-efficacy beliefs of uh, teachers, and so I'd like to do some more reading in um, the school administrators as teachers of teachers and how that affects the teacher's self-efficacy motivation for uh, using those procedures. Okay, and if you'll just jot me a note, I'll be glad to uh, give you the reference and, and uh, put you in touch with that, uh, that research. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Looks like they're, they're, letting you off the, they're letting you off the hook pretty easy here, John. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that one hour of andragogy does not convince anybody of anything, if you will. Uh, it simply is, uh, I, I've sought to, to give, us a, give you a taster experience of doing a, a, a dynamic lecture in an andragogical fashion. I've used this, um, I wrote about it, and you'll see my article in there. I wrote about it in 1975. I've been using it in a variety of, of places. I used it with, um, uh, with a group over in, uh, uh, over in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, of 100 uh, uh, people from, uh, from some of the major corporations in the Arab world. I've used it online. I've used it in my classes. I've used it in various conferences. This is the first time that I've used it, however, uh, in, uh, in a video, uh, uh, instructional video um, interaction. So uh, you've given me the experience of um, saying I need to hone my skills uh, to improve if I ever get a chance to do this again. Uh, this uh, actually worked very well, I thought. I mean, you being so far away, uh, that was perfect. And it was wonderful to not only give a, uh, a lecture, if, as, it, as it were, on uh, adult learning principles, but then to actually uh, give us a practical application of what uh, an experimentation of what adult learning principles can be in the classroom. And I have to say that it takes a very brave teacher to uh, open themselves up and has to be very trusting in their, uh, their knowledge base that they're going to be able to uh, lose control and allow the, uh, allow the participants to ask virtually any question on their mind. That's right. You have to be an awful confident person. And I want to thank you. Uh, everybody, please give John a round of applause. Thank you, John, for uh, everything. One, one last comment that I'd like to make is, uh, uh, Tom, is that, uh, that uh, an article that uh, I may send to uh, one of you, you or uh, Dr. Stamen, um, uh, Andragogy, uh, the whole business about uh, learning for self-direction in the classroom by Marilyn Taylor. You'll see the phases that, uh, that, his, th that that's gone through. Herman Niebuhr, uh, in Teaching and Learning in the 80s, uh, suggested that uh, the school systems need to be moving in the direction of self-directedness. Arthur Combs, back in 1966, said they, that, uh, that uh, self-directed learning needs to be fostered. And so there's a, a lot of research out there. And I'd be glad to send some of this material to you so that you can distribute it among your people. And I'd be uh, happy to have any kind of interaction with you in, in the in the future because my website is available for you to download and print off whatever is there uh, and, and I want to make it accessible for uh, spreading, as Tom said earlier, the gospel. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Thank I, you. I have to have yeah, to attest I, I, that the website that John has is very extensive and uh, once you go there you'll see just uh, uh, many, many, many documents there that are available. Thank you so much for the privilege and the honor of being able to interact with you all, the, these doctoral students and faculty at North Dakota State. I you, appreciate sir. it very much. Thank you. That's wonderful, John. It's really a privilege to have a renowned international uh, expert come and speak to us here in Fargo and still be able to go home tonight in St. Louis. Makes me think of the song, Meet Me in St. Louis. <laughs> all right. Ha, ha, ha.